your seat and have to look at the noise. So one of the greatest challenges that we face when trying to understand the diversity of metrics uh, around open source is having one place that we can go and have those metrics organized in a way that we can get a result and a comparison prepared and ready for any set of repositories that we want to work with. So Augur has been defined for a long time around the idea of being able to do comparisons, download your data, look at any repo group on GitHub or not, see the issues, the comments, things like that, but all in one place. So some of you are familiar with what we've done before. I want to tell you a little bit about the things that you cannot see here right now. The first is that we now gather all data from all sources into an organized, relationally structured database so that the integrity of the data that we're collecting is guaranteed, not just by the integrity of a normal database, but by uh, tests that we have that ensure that, that, hap that things happen correctly. The second, we have a distributed worker architecture that's easy to extend information to. So if you have something that you want to collect, we have several models, I think we have eight workers that are working right now, that will go out and you can define where you want to get the data from, what APIs you want to call, how to collect it, and then you can build an API for it. And so this is the, the front end of Augur, which is the pretty part, but there's a lot of technology behind it that I think is really interesting and important to understand. So I'm going to highlight a few things. The first thing I'm going to highlight is insights. So if we're able to collect information on over 60 different specific metrics, so we have metrics that are included in chaos and metrics that we've conceived while working with organizations that are part of chaos and haven't yet gone through the process of making into chaos metrics. If we can conceive of these 60 metrics and the question what's interesting or what's changed is often what's asked, how do we tell you that? How do we let you have an easy view of what's the most significant, interesting change? And so we have what we call an insight worker system that goes through every single endpoint for every single repository in a repository groups and identifies where the greatest anomalies are. So for example, right now, this open SSL um, is, a, is a repository that's being used by the risk working group to look at uh, things that are interesting. So if I click on this, I'm going to see what is, what is interesting about risk. So it, what it told me, I guess what I didn't show you or didn't read to you back here is this repository has a sharp decrease in commit count within the past year, basically. So right now we're looking at time frames for the past year, but you can set that for 90 days, you can set that for a week, you can look for anomalies over whatever period you want. We've set it for a year in this case. And OpenSSL has a significant decrease in commits. And you can see that we have a significant number of commits right here. And so you can dig in to what is, what is the origin of the insight. And Augur identifies these kinds of spikes or anomalies or for whatever time period you want to specify for you <clears throat> right out of the gate. Um, the second thing we can show you is a lot of the detail about any particular repository. So this particular one is one that the value group is looking at under the incubator MX site. And I forget which repository group that's in. But so there's a set of uh, GitHub organizations that the value working group is looking at. And these are uh, essentially who are the big committers. And you can see by color that purple person is the big committer. The top 10 committers are listed numerically. And then we can see uh, information about lines of code added over time, um, the total ratio of lines of code. Um, if we had organization information, we could show that. Um, and then this looks at lines of code added by the top 10 authors uh, over the life of the project. So you can see who's committing what, deleting, adding, where, where. Let me stop sucking the air out of the room and ask if anyone has any questions about what I've described so far. Yes. So do you measure uh, repositories with the high output or only average output? Because it's, it's completely changed the way you see it. And if it has like a low quantity of comments and very high active quantity of comments. So I think if I understand the question, it's if, I, if we're looking at repos, how do we compare repos that have a very low volume to begin with and repos that have a very high volume to begin with? 
So we are looking statistically at the absolute difference in the context of that repo, so something equivalent to a z-score. So within the repo, it isn't if I have, a, if one repo has an average of 30 commits a week and another repo has an average of 30,000 commits a week. A significant change in the 30 repos is going to show up just as quickly as a significant change in the 30,000 repos and vice versa. So we're looking at the repos in the context of themselves. We can also calculate across the repository group to see if the group as a whole is, is doing things. And we, one of the things that I think is really interesting that we can do is identify in short periods of time, are there issues that are getting a lot of comments or pull requests that are getting a lot of comments really out of the norm? Um, and I think some of that is, um, is super interesting, uh, potentially. We do, so, and that's largely because not all Git service providers treat uh, Git pull requests and issues the same. Uh, GitLab and Bit, uh, Bitbucket handle things differently, and we bring all of the data from all of those services into a single data model so that we can compare apples to apples across platforms. Andy. Sean, if I wanted to There is, and it used to be extremely hard. Uh, I think it's a lot easier now. Um, Gabe and Carter, who are developers for Augur, um, can tell, me, tell you a lot more about the details. Uh, we made a couple critical changes uh, over the summer with our Google Summer of Code students. Uh, one is we changed all of the front end work from TypeScript, or from JavaScript to TypeScript. Uh, that makes it more definitive, and it also requires a lot less code. So it's, it's a lot easier. Um, we've also included uh, the steps that you use to add a view visualization, I think, are more clearly understandable than they were before. So I think you do have to know a little bit about Vue and Vue.js and Vue CLI to add a visualization. And as you know, those, you know, some of the, a lot of people in this room are not front end technology people, but we do have templates that we, you know, each metric that's here, um, you can copy. And these metrics come out of, what's, what's, the, what's the visualization library we use? Vega and Vega Lite. So you can actually go to Vega and Vega Lite and you know explore what kinds of visualizations are are available there and figure out which of our APIs you can use to fill those visualizations in and, and sort of follow a pattern. And we're working on, on making that more clear. Emma? Right. So uh, in, my, in my experience, organizational affiliation is a difficult, it's difficult. Typically it's managed, there are, two, there are two things. One is an organization within its own boundaries can manage those affiliations in that list without any implications for GDPR or the other privacy laws that are, are coming into play. So that's thing one. And so they can maintain those maps and some companies that we work with have started to do that. The second thing is that we have a worker or an, uh, sort of a model that we use now that we, we go through all the Git repositories, collect all the emails, and then search various web APIs to identify organizational affiliations or GitHub IDs for those individuals. So to the extent they keep information up to date on other web properties, we can make probable guesses about that. But those are not, that's not good enough Typically, I mean, I think there's, you're always, if you're really wanting to manage an organizational affiliation, I think, I think that you're going to have to do something to do that. Now, a third comment I have about organizational affiliation is that I think some of the work of the diversity and inclusion group and the common group can lead to the implementation of something like, say, Hyperledger Indie that would allow developers to share anonymously some of their demographic information and maybe make some of the things about ourselves that companies are interested in and that other projects are interested in visible in an anonymized and secure way that the, that the personal, the individual user controls the privacy and, and sort of sharing of. Like, so we have the technology, like we have the technology to toast both sides of the Pop-Tart, but we haven't done it yet. 
and, and it's the same thing. I think we have the technology to give developers a, an authentication system that they can trust so that more information can be shared without us, you know, I think for certain, re for certain reasons, I'm afraid to share certain information about myself online. Um, and I think a lot of people are the same way, but if we offer them a secure way to do it that's in a federated, distributed, encrypted form like, you know, Hyperledger Indie, you know, I think that's a contribution that Chaos Project could potentially make. I'll continue with my auger demo. How much time do I have left? Okay. I want to show you something. Um, it's not fully functional yet, but it is kind of cool. Okay. Right. So if I go, we have now a Slack app. And if I just type that Slack app and the word insights, it's going to, and we can have it triggered by other words and we're also going to push it. But it's basically able to send us now, remember I showed you this, this uh, top insights page over here? So whatever the top insights page is for your projects, if you have a new insight that surfaces on a day, we have the ability for you to add a Slack notifier into a Slack channel and it'll just send you, it'll, uh, it'll send you however many Slack notifications you have for insights on whatever period that you select. Which I think transforming metrics from something that you have to go to the dashboard to, to see to something that can actually be pushed for you, like here's a significant change, I think is super powerful. Um, can you explain that a little bit? Sure. So, this is, um, I don't have the, we don't have the um, actual metrics sent yet. So uh, the, we're, we've got the Slack part working and we've got the Insight part working and we didn't quite connect them before this. They might be connected this afternoon in our workshop. So, yeah, so, so that, <laughs> that's, how, <laughs> that's how fast that's happening. And, but the, the, way that the, the way that the worker works is, or the way that the Slack bot works, I think, is, is um, in whatever channel you choose to subscribe to. So, like, right now I've subscribed in uh, OSS. Uh, I've subscribed in general. But if I do um, OSS health notifier in there, uh, I, I just invite them to the channel and then that adds the health notifier to that channel. Uh, I previously installed the app in the site so the first time you do it in a channel it'll install it in your Slack site and the second time you're just subscribing a channel to it. Exactly and I'm looking for, uh, I think under, is it dev support? There was, it was great, uh, Jonah, our developer that did this, sent a bunch of these yesterday. Um, that had like too many replies. Uh, so what I think what's, there's a small nit in the design where you, you all know how you can be overwhelmed by Slack. Like if a notifier sent you 30 messages in one day, that would be super annoying. So the notifier will send you one message and then thread, like if you have 30 interesting notifications because you're monitoring 5,000 repositories, it's going to send them all in one post and then all the individual details under a thread so that it's not a nuisance for people that are examining large numbers of repositories. Hey, yeah. Yes, the intention is that we're looking for anomalies. That uh, What Gabe is doing is going through all of our endpoints for each repository and identifying ones that have significant outlying conditions in whatever time period we specify. So, yeah, it's anomaly detection. So, like, Jeff would identify the time period and what constitutes an anomaly with the person? Right now, we're defining what an anomaly is, that if it's, if it's like, if we, if we take a three, like a one-year average, we're going to say that, and, and you're interested in things that happened in the last month, yeah. we're going to notify you of things from the last month that, that are anomalous in the context of the previous year. So what would be, like, is the percentage change? Yep. Okay. Yeah, Gabe, do you want to add any details to that? Yeah, well, there, there could be, like, uh, many different ways to discover an insight. Right now, our first version of this uh, insight worker uses a confidence interval, and 
And so whenever it exceeds a 95% confidence interval for whatever time period you specify uh, that you want to define as the context um, for defining that confidence interval, okay. whenever it exceeds that, it would give you a yeah, yeah. Okay. It would tell you. Um, we also have a risk page, which Matt is, Matt's going to talk about, so I won't steal that. Um, you can also see um, a complete list of the repos. There's 2,200 repos that are listed in this particular example. Um, you can sort them by the total number of issues identified. Obviously, some repositories have zero issues because they don't use GitHub issues. Um, we haven't put in a description because I'm lazy. Um, you'll see the total commit counts, the total issue counts. I can sort by however many of these I want to do. I can see a list of the repo groups and then go under here uh, to see which repos are under each repo group. These are the ones that we're, we're currently tracking. Um, and then um, I had a comparison page open, I think. That's my, didn't I open a comparison page? I swear I had one. All right, yeah, I do. So I just wanna go through the like active guessing here because some of them have no issues whatsoever and the, the comparisons that we're showing right now are issues. Um, so here's a case where we can see uh, two different repositories, the closed issues per week, and this, the um, opened issues per week over time and how they've changed. And you can see uh, each repository is a different color and you can compare, is it up to like eight different repositories that you can compare, Gabe? Gabe, is it like eight different repositories that we limited at? Uh, yes. So, and that's just a function, we're just like preventing people from creating graphical nuisances for themselves. We could give you the ability to do 100, but that would be a, unreadable. Um, we've also continued the, the thing that we had in the older version of Augur, which is we can download as an SVG, a PNG, uh, view the source, uh, or open in a Vega editor. And I believe some of them have JSON download already implemented as well, which these are longstanding features in Augur that let people take viz from the Augur and just put it in a PowerPoint or data and share it with other people. So that's got to be five minutes, right? Okay. <laughs> any last questions? Yeah, if you have any questions, maybe Arbitrum can come up and answer it. Andy? What is the use model for this? Is it software as a service? Do I download it? Do I have the user and I want to get my hands on how I it? So the, frankly, historically, we've been gluing together a lot of different work and it's been not a service model by some kind of intricate design. We're academics, not, there's no business model. Um, yeah, you can unplug me. Uh, uh, in the last, over the summer, I think we've got it pretty close to the point where we have an install script, a startup script, a shutdown script, um, things that let you just kind of load, you know, clone it and load it. Um, the most, there's a few steps. I mean, there's a very detailed set of instructions so anybody can technically download it, install it, and we're making it easier and easier for people to do that every day. But there's, there's still certain infrastructure technology that you know, we answer questions about um, on a regular basis. The, like if you wanted this right now, I could have something going very quickly, uh, our team could. And if, if you want to try and download it, I think it's much easier to do than it was even like three weeks ago, the last time I had someone try to do it from scratch. That's great. Can I ask one more question? Yeah. Sure. So the last question I have is, um, what types of assistance would you guys like? From, from I, the community? Well, we're an open source project, so we welcome contributions and you know, we're, we're working active, I mean, I think the open, the new contributor experience is made much easier by the easier installation. I think right now we have a very, we have a significant number of APIs that could, that are described and linked to chaos metrics. I think there are chaos metrics that can be created from the API endpoints that we have. 
that are not chaos metrics yet. I think that there's additional contextualization and documentation that could be put around those endpoints because I think one of the, we found with a few users that the real pow, one of the real powers of Augur is I can have a data group pull together this data and monitor that infrastructure and then serve up a bunch of APIs. And to the extent that the APIs are explained in the ways that people who do reports inside of an organization want to communicate them, then you can use your own web development infrastructure, your own internal tooling uh, to determine how you share it, right? So you don't have to use the Augur front end. In fact, they're physically in the same repository, but they are logically connected only through the API. It's a RESTful API. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Oh.